Good morning, regular physics. Uh, this is October 1st, and we are studying uh, beginning chapter six. Uh, it will be a chapter that gets split up by our October break that's coming up, uh, but still we're going to start it now. Um, we're looking at Newton's first law and Newton's second law today. And yesterday you were assigned a lab, which is really now actually talked about today. So, uh, you know, you, you get a full week, so therefore that shouldn't be an issue. Plus, also, you had a test this week. Uh, hopefully, by now, we've had these scored and they've been sent back to you. Um, and we've talked about it and all that, and we're ready to move on to Chapter 6. So that's where we are right now. Um, our notes for today take us into, get into the right file here. The first two sections, we're covering two sections today because remember this is a block schedule so we have enough time to do two sections in one day and also both of these are pretty short sections so it's not um, uh, much of an issue for us. Um, sorry, things I should have been thinking about right now. Sorry. So, um, let's open these notes and get started in chapter six. All right, so first of all, Newton's first law really began with Galileo when Galileo termed the phrase inertia. He recognized that um, that an object isn't going to really want, it's going to resist change. And the word inertia was a uh, Latin word that kind of means laziness. And so it's just an idea that objects resist change. In the formulation of Newton's three laws, uh, the first law therefore then had to become um, this law of inertia because it was necessary in order to uh, get to the point where we can talk about forces that we know that the object itself is not going to change what it's doing unless a net, for a net force acts on it. So an object in motion, so if we roll a ball, it's gonna stay with that motion unless a net force acts on it. And then an object that is at rest has no reason to stop doing what it's doing, like our, our table setting that we have here, unless a net force acts on it, okay? Um, Whatever an object is doing will not change unless net force acts on it. That's exactly what I'm saying. And the rest is really just a special case of rolling, isn't it? If you have motion, something is moving, or something is not moving, it's just the case where the velocity is zero. Um, inertia, I already talked about that, is the tendency for an object to resist change. So we always have to do the classic uh, table clock trick, which is, and some of you may have noticed that this is kind of what your lab is, is doing from yesterday. It's just a simple, you find something that you can set up as an inertia trick. It could even just be a tablecloth, one like this. Try not to break anything. Um, we do have one piece of glassware on there because we have to make it at least somewhat exciting to see, will it break that uh, beaker? Um, but if we pull quick enough, we see that our stuff stays on the table as we would expect. There's not much friction coming from this, uh, this uh, picnic tablecloth. And so therefore, as it's pulled quickly out from underneath the objects, um, not much force is exerted on the bottom of them, so therefore they don't move much. While talking about inertia, when we're in class, one of my favorite tricks to do on one student, by now at this time of the year, we would know who in class needs to have a trick performed on them. And so I go back into my storage room and I pick up what appears to be two bowling balls, okay? And I walk into the classroom like these are both so heavy, and I start talking about if we were to go uh, up into like, let's say, let's say where there's no gravity. So the, if we talk about like a space station or something like that, there's gravity there. But what's happening is, is the, the space station is falling around the earth. So everything inside of it is in free fall. So it doesn't feel like there's gravity. Everything feels apparently weightless. Okay. So I say to the students, say to you, how would we know? Uh, which of these two bowling balls is heavier? How could we tell when you can't use the weight? Because if we're all in free fall, everything's going to feel weightless. How would you know which bowling ball is actually heavier other than judging it by size? Because you would think, well, this one, because it's smaller, might be lighter. Maybe it's made of something that is less dense. And about now in classes where I kind of go, oh, oh, and I drop this one into somebody, onto somebody's desk. And of course, what we see is nothing happens because it's just a plastic, you know, or maybe rubber ball, right? So, but how would you know the difference between these two if we were up in, in a space station? So the idea would be inertia is the idea that you could take this heavy bowling ball, this is a true bowling ball, and you could move it back and forth in your hands. And what's going to happen is as you try to move it one way, 
it's going to be kind of a Newton's third law thing, which we don't study yet. This is later in this chapter. You're going to end up getting moved the other way. If you threw this to your astronaut partner that's up there, when you throw it, you're going to get pushed backward. And when they catch it, it's going to cause them to start sliding backward or floating backward as well. So we can recognize the inertia because of the fact that in that weightless situation, it does it resists changing what it's doing because of the size of the mass. Okay. So as you're setting up the lab from that was assigned to you yesterday, be thinking of things like that. I think one of the conclusion questions will actually ask you, uh, would it be easier to conduct a tablecloth trick with a super, super lightweight piece of styrofoam or to do it with something heavier like made of metal? And hopefully you're thinking, well, the piece of styrofoam will probably ride with the tablecloth right off the table. Maybe I should add that into this uh, demonstration from now on. You're the first year. Well, at least talking about it. Um, what exactly is a force? We all know what a force is, but you look at that definition, it's like in physics, like, really? That's all the more you can say for a force is, is a push or a pull. Um, it's, it's a condition that causes something to change its motion, right? And in, in the end, really all it is is either something being pulled on or something being pushed on. And either what's causing it is either in contact with the object or it's exerting it at a distance, right? So when you're uh, skydiving, which I'm sure is one of our examples coming up here real soon, um, how does the earth, how does gravity of the earth know you're even there? There must be something that a gravitational field is established that, um, that lets lets the earth know that you're there. Einstein changed this in general relativity to be that any kind of mass bends the space-time continuum and that you really are, I don't know exactly what we would say that means with your motion, but that space and time are bent. But that gets into craziness. Classical physics just says there's a gravitational field. Um, when you come crashing back down to the earth, hopefully you have a parachute, and you get back to the earth and you're standing there, then we know that an object is not moving. Or maybe let's even talk about when you open your parachute and you're moving at a constant speed back down to the earth. We would say that the forces are in equilibrium in those circumstances. Uh, whether you're not moving or moving at a constant speed, the forces all somehow cancel out. So that's really what today's notes have to cover a lot of. And we show that by drawing three body diagrams, which is really kind of the main po purpose of this first set of notes. We're doing two sections today. Um, finding net forces is adding vectors the way you already know how to add vectors. So in the first question, uh, to add those vectors, we take the first one, in this case red. Maybe I want to put it out here in space somewhere where I have room to write. After I draw it in the same direction and what appears to be the same length, then I take the second vector and I put them head to tail, also pointing the same direction to the right, try to make it the same length. And my resulting vector goes from where I first started to where I last ended up. So if I can get this the right length, looks like that. Perfect. Okay. So in other words, these two forces are helping each other. If you're reading through this on the slides as you go through this video, or if you look at the slides, I've written these out really, really well, uh, page by page with lots of explanations on them. All the things that I'm trying to say to you, uh, you know, auditorily, are actually written down so you can actually take the time to make sure that all of this makes sense. In the second picture, we take the first vector still, same thing, and then we take the second vector, add them head to tail, and this time we get what we remember from our last uh, test is we get the pi fag is how we find the resultant force that connects the first to the last from where we started to where we end up, okay? So that's going to push something off course. Right, And then uh, the third one for letter C, we have two vectors, starting with the vector F1, which still points the same way as the other two above. And then vector F2 now points the opposite direction. I don't want to put it right on top of vector F1 because then it looks confusing in the picture. Oh, that kind of fell down just a little bit. You can handle that. And the resulting vector goes from where we started to where we last end up. And so there's my resulting vector. So these two are working against each other. Picture this as being like either a tug of war. Well, the rope's going to move in the direction of F1 since it's winning. Or a push of war. Could two people be pushing on things, something from the opposite sides? 
Maybe we don't even have to have two people working against each other. That sounds so divisive. How about if instead we can say you're pushing in one direction and friction is trying to prevent that. That'll be coming up later this chapter. Um, Newton's second law, which is really the main goal of the second part of these notes today. It's going to look specifically at weight. Newton's second law is, is really the most important formula in all of physics. And what's nice is it's that simple. What makes this difficult is really as we progress through this chapter um, is what is the force? Is finding the net force, which is what we just did on the last slide. Remember, if you don't like these answers, look at the ones online because I've got these spelled out really, really well with explanations on all of it. All of these create a net force, which causes an acceleration. Here, we would say the acceleration is really big. Here, we would say the acceleration is off at an angle. And here, we would say the acceleration is small, right? So whatever the net force is doing is causing the mass to accelerate. And then, of course, the bigger the mass, the less the acceleration. So there's really a lot going on in this simple little formula that's there, but at least the math of it is really that simple. All right, the units of force. Okay, so since mass is measured in kilograms and acceleration is measured in meters over seconds squared, we get a unit that's called kilograms meters over seconds squared. Well, that doesn't sound very friendly, does it? So what physics did is said, let's just bundle this all up together and let's call it a Newton in honor of Isaac Newton. And so now we have the symbol just as an N. What does this mean for you? Know that force is made up of mass and acceleration. It doesn't always mean that a mass is going to be accelerating, but just know that it's made up of it. And then more important than that is when you see the unit of N, you know you're talking about a force, okay? When you see the units of kilograms, you know you're talking about a mass. And then we already know acceleration because we've done that so many times. All right. Example two, uh, draw the forces acting on each of the objects. And so uh, we have five of these to do. I'll, I'm going to go through this quickly. Of course, you can pause in between each one. And I will talk about each one as I do it. All right. First thing that we can say in every single picture that is here is begin by being Zen with putting a gravitational force. Now, this bucket looks like it's the same bucket every single time. So I'm going to try to draw FG exactly the same length every single time. Sorry, the first one came out kind of curvy. That was the pen moving on this uh, writing pad. Here we have a car. Obviously, that one's going to be a lot larger FG to begin with. So see how I put an FG into every one of these pictures. That's being Zen, knowing that there's always a force of gravity when you're near the Earth. Okay. Now, this ice block is not accelerating into the Earth. So the earth has stopped it from moving. That means that the earth is also holding it up. So the earth is doing craziness right now. Not only is it pulling it down, it's also pushing it up. Now I'm gonna draw this twice. Don't draw it yet. You just don't pause the video yet. The normal force on this block is acting right here. That's where the force that cancels out FG is. But that's too confusing drawing it in the middle of the object like that. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna label all of our free body diagrams with the force coming out of the object. Don't push it into it. Don't push it through it. Draw it coming off of the object, okay? Now, I just slipped and referred to that as a name of its true name. This force here that holds it up is called the normal force. We'll just abbreviate it as FN, but maybe for this first example, let's actually write the word normal there, okay? That normal force, maybe we can put right next to it, FN. Um, that term normal is a mathematical term used in physics to represent where we have a force that's being exerted perpendicular to a surface. The surface pushes up on it straight up, okay? Don't be bothered by it, just get used to it. Know that Fn, Fn is not F net, exclamation point. These are two completely separate things, even if they both share a F sub N, one ends at F sub N, formal, and the other one is F sub N, et. They're two totally different things, so don't mix those together. Okay. Equal and opposite implies the ice block is not moved. A rope holds a bucket in the air. Okay, ropes exert what are called tension forces. 
FT. But for this first example, we'll actually write out the name. I love my notes online. I spent a lot of time this summer writing these out step by step by step. So if you don't get this from me, you get it from the notes. Should make sense. There's a tension force here. If the bucket is not moving, just being held there in air, we know that these two forces are equal and opposite. So notice how I try to draw the vectors the same length, the same way I try to draw these two vectors the same length. Okay. A rope lifts a bucket at a constant speed. Well, constant speed is not acceleration. Therefore, there is still no net force. So I draw these two equal and opposite length. I'm sorry, it's supposed to give me at least a moment to push pause, but most of you are pretty good about that. A rope lifts a bucket and its speed is increasing. Okay, its speed is increasing is a fancy or less fancy way of saying that it's accelerating. So if you want it to accelerate upward, then that means you need to be pulling on it with a tension force that is bigger than Fg. So that your net force, we could write out a net force equation, would say Ft is beating Fg. We're going to be making a lot of those later on in this chapter, so we might as well start right now. Okay? And then right now for F net, we put in M times A, and then enough information has to be given so that we could solve for something. Either the, Usually the two classic things we solve for is how much tension is in that rope or how much acceleration does the bucket have. A car is being pushed across the street at a constant speed. So if somebody's pushing on it, we don't draw the pushing force pushing into it. That would make sense. Physics likes to make the forces coming out of the object. So even though it's a push, let's draw it like it's a pull. Okay. Now, if those are the two forces that are acting on it, don't draw this. The car would move this way. But I think we all would agree that when cars are being pushed across the street, they don't move that way. So we can't use that as our force. It tells me that both of these must have things that cancel them out. For FG, I know, you're already thinking it. Equal and opposite to FG is that one from up above, Fn. There's a normal force acting on the car no differently than there's a normal force acting on the ice block, other than it's a different size. Now, the force of the push. Well, we know that it's hard to push a car across the street, not just because of the, of the inertia, but because of the friction. So we recognize that if you're pushing it at a constant speed, probably the friction force is what is trying to prevent that. And by seeing on this slide, Fg, Fn, F sub F, and F sub T, you've basically seen all the forces that matter in physics. Those are the ones that we extensively study. Okay. I added F nets on all of these problems except for E. Uh, wouldn't be a bad idea for you to do that too. I even added some notes explaining those things there. The only note I did not include was that this is friction, but you'll get that once we get the friction, you'll be used to it. Air drag, uh, I'm going to go through this quickly too. You can stop and, and copy pictures as you want to. There's not going to be a question on your test about air drag, but you should understand a few things about, about skydiving. Number one is make sure that whoever packed your parachute is qualified, whoever's training you to do is qualified. And know that when you first jump out of that airplane or if you're base jumping or whatever, that when you first uh, drop, your acceleration is full on, full gravity. 9.8 meters per second squared is what your speed is increasing by. But it doesn't stay doing that. And the reason why is because as you start passing through the air, your velocity starts picking up. Right now, there's no velocity. In the second picture, after you've fallen for a little while, you eventually reach a point where you're going so fast that the air breaking around you to get out of your way, remember, it has inertia too, just not a lot, is exerting a force on you. So eventually you get going fast enough where your speed reaches a maximum velocity, sometimes called terminal speed or terminal velocity, okay? For a human being that's spread out like this, you know, spread eagle as you fall, it's around just under 100 miles per hour. So definitely it's, it's going to be mo most likely fatal if you hit the ground like that. So what we do instead is we open up a parachute. When you open up a parachute, what happens is, is the first immediate reaction to that is the air resistance becomes really big because of the surface area of the parachute, okay? Now, what that does then is make your acceleration a deceleration because your F net is in the opposite direction. So what you do is you slow down from your maximum speed, but you never reach the point where you start going up. That doesn't make any sense. We know that's not true. 
But what you do is you reach a point where this air resistance, as you go slower and slower and slower, it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller till eventually it's the exact same size as FG. Then at that new speed, you continue the rest of the way down. And that much lower speed is a much lower terminal velocity and you safely come back down to the ground. Okay. Uh, there's no question on this on your test. I just include this right now because it's a great way to look at net forces drawing uh, the free body diagrams on the objects. Um, but we're going to avoid that for the test. That's your first homework assignment is questions one through eight. Your second assignment today is chapter 6.2. Here we're looking at the difference between mass and weight. Okay, so if it's true, and I might even have this on the next picture, uh, I don't know that I want to start with that one. On this, the picture after that, it's going to show a person that's standing on the ground. Okay, so to be standing on the ground, we know, ah, try to switch colors here. We know the person standing on the ground is not moving, not accelerating. Okay, so what does that tell us about this person standing on the ground? Well, they have a force of gravity. And just like you just learned from the last section, there's also a normal force that is pointing upward, Fn and Fg. And they happen to be equal and opposite to each other. Okay, if you stood on a bathroom scale right here, we would say that that scale reads your weight. But that's not really true. What that scale really reads is how much the earth has to push back up in order to hold you up from your weight. Okay, because if you, like the first picture is gonna show, if you just go skydiving and you jump out of an airplane, you couldn't stand on a bathroom scale and have a bathroom scale read anything. You're free falling, there's no way to squish the bathroom scale if there's nothing underneath it to hold it up, All right? So our simplest, uh, substitution in F equals MA, Newton's second law, is to talk about weight and say that FG equals mass times the acceleration of gravity. So we can say that the force of gravity acting on this person right now is some number of Newtons. Typically, if this is like, let's say, a 50 kilogram person, it's going to be 500 Newtons. Okay, let's actually put that in here. So M equals 50 kilograms, which means that F equals M times G equals 50 kilograms times the acceleration of gravity. I like to round it to 10 in this chapter because then like nine out of 10 times, I don't have to get my calculator out. You're, you can do that too, okay? It's 500 Newtons. So we can't say that what the scale reads is 500 Newtons. So when I say their weight is 500 Newtons, please understand that's not, you cannot in your mind visualize somebody standing on a bathroom scale if I say their weight is 500 Newtons. Their weight is 120 pounds. You can't do that because this is not a bathroom scale. This is just saying the force of gravity is 500 Newtons. The force of gravity is 120 pounds, okay? When you stand on a bathroom scale, and this is that our picture that we had from the first one here, um, that bathroom scale doesn't actually read the person's weight. What it actually reads is the amount that the earth has to push back up in order to hold you there. It happens to be the same as the person's weight, but we need to differentiate between those two because in about in a second, we're going to see that we can make that bathroom scale read different numbers uh, by doing different things. For example, what if you went and stood on a bathroom scale and you had your backpack on? Would it tell you your weight? No, it's going to tell you that if you weigh 120 pounds, that you weigh 130 pounds. So it's not telling you your weight. It's telling you your weight plus also whatever you have on you. So in other words, it's saying, how much did the earth have to hold up the bathroom scale, hold up you with, squish the bathroom scale, okay? So if it's you plus the, with, plus the backpack, it's gonna read more. What if you're in the bathroom where you're, most people have their bathroom scales in the bathroom and it's right next to the sink and while you're standing on the bathroom scale, you're like, you know what, that reads too much. And so you put your hand down on the edge of the sink and kind of push up a little bit. Now you see the bathroom scale that should read 120 pounds only reads 110. Well, then it's not reading your weight, is it? It's reading how much the earth has to hold you up because of whatever the circumstances of the problem are. Bathroom scales don't read weight, they read normal force. Weight is the force of gravity when you take mass times gravity, okay? You've got to differentiate between those terms. There's the words that I'll explain that. You can pause and copy that down on your own.
All right, my mass is 80 kilograms. What is my weight? Fg equals m times g equals 80 kilograms times 10 meters per second squared equals 800 newtons. And I hope that we never have to show that math ever again. We all know that mass is the 80 kilograms, weight is adding a zero to it. What's my mass on the moon? Thing about mass is it's the amount of matter that makes you up. That number doesn't change. If you take a triple beam balance to the moon and you mass a quarter, it's going to read the same thing as it reads here on Earth because it's based on balancing two sides of it, that the mass hanging off one end of the balance equals the mass on the other side. Even if their weights are different on the moon, the ratio of them is still the same. So mass is mass. You get the same mass no matter where you are. Now, if the gravity on the moon is only one sixth of what it is here, what is our weight? Well, then we would say Fg for the moon equals mass times gravity on the moon. 80 kilograms times 1.67 meters per second squared. I don't have an answer slide, but I have a calculator. Hundred and thirty three point six. So if your legs are used to lifting up 800 newtons and you go to the moon and you decide to take a basketball hoop with you, you better have some way to extend it because an eight, uh, 10 foot hoop is going to be pretty boring. You're going to be dunking. You're going to be doing somersaults. You're going to be doing all sorts of stuff. You might want to extend it to 15 feet so that it actually is a little bit more fun while you're dunking. And don't worry about the falling back down from 15 feet up hurting yourself because your acceleration is still going to be a lot less too. Eventually your legs will get used to the acceleration on the moon. They're going to atrophy. And then when you come back to the earth, you won't even be able to stand up. Now, this is a hard part. I've spelled all of this out in the notes, nice and slow. So if you want to spend your time looking at the slides, you can get through all of this if you want to, but I'm going to just give you a simple formula that tells you what happens to your weight when you accelerate upward or accelerate downward. And these are the formulas for that. Remember that the scale that the astronaut here, I'm not sure why it has to be an astronaut, I guess because I kept talking about astronauts. The scale that is here reads the normal force. So when they ask what is the apparent weight of the person, their force of gravity is 500 newtons, for example, too. But the reading of the scale, what we would call the weight, is going to be something uh, more or less based on what the acceleration is doing. So just follow the formulas through. So if you want to, I'll pause or you're going to pause and read through those other slides and you can start this video up again if you want to. So they're standing on a bathroom scale in an elevator that's not moving. What does the scale read? Fg equals 500 newtons. If the elevator accelerates upward, now in order to accelerate upward, that means that the normal force, and I'm not gonna require you to do this on your test, which is why I didn't make a bunch of pictures for this. I do this to AP physics because they have to do this on their test. But in order for letter B to be true, this normal force has to increase to something bigger. It has to be taller than FG so that we have upward acceleration. So if the scale reads the normal force, we need it to read more than 500 Newtons. So that's why we have this formula right here. It says if you accelerate upward, F equals 50 times, I'm not sure I'm going with that, 50 times 10 plus 2. So instead of you weighing 500 newtons, you're now up to 600 newtons. Okay. Now, elevators don't keep accelerating, right? They just accelerate until they get to their speed that they want to go. Then they travel at a constant speed the rest of the way. Once it's traveling at a constant speed, your weight's going to go back to 500 because we could say then that F equals 50 times 10 plus no extra acceleration is back to eat to reading the 50, the 500 newtons that we expect in the first place okay a constant speed uh nothing's out of the ordinary now what if the elevator is at the top and now a person pushes the down floor button and it accelerates downward well as it accelerates downward now the opposite thing occurs as our picture is that the gravity force has to be longer than the normal force but don't make it longer because we can't do that. The force of gravity, we got to be Zen. It's always the same length because it represents a 500 Newton person. 
what we need to do is make the normal force shorter. So normal force, what the scale reads, lengthens and shortens its vector based on what's happening in the problem. That's a really difficult topic. And so for those of you juniors that take AP Physics next year, that's one of the things that we will be tackling. And you'll get it because mine are getting it now. They get it every year. But for regular physics, we stop at just here's some formulas. And then you just use for accelerating upward, you add the acceleration, accelerating downward, you subtract out the uh, acceleration. So F equals 50 times 10 minus 2, which now then means that you only act like you're weighing 400 newtons. That's what the scale reads. What if this elevator started to, you know, the cables in it started to fray and your acceleration increased to 5 meters per second? What would you weigh? What would the scale read? Your weight would still be 500. But what the scale reads, your apparent weight, would drop down to 250. Okay. What if the cable snapped completely, which is why we have the section in the first place? This is how we explain free fall is 50. Remember that we're rounding 9.8 to 10. 10 minus 10 says you can't squish the scale. Your apparent weight is zero. We would say that you are weightless. Okay. But we know you're not weightless. Your weight is 500 newtons. So be careful with the usage of the terms knowing that what it means is that your reading of a scale is zero because you're in free fall. Now, I got one more example, then we're all done. Um, I don't plan on putting this on the test because this just puts too many things together in one problem. But I'm not going to say that I won't put it on the test. If I feel like I'm not being met halfway with, this, with distance learning, um, I might decide to go back and put something like this on the test. So. Uh, all things are possible, everything's on the table, but my plan as of right now is to not have this on the test. Why is this so hard? Okay, so a 50 kilogram bucket means that its weight, Fg, equals 500 newtons. That's a heavy bucket, okay? It's being lifted upward, and whoever's lifting it is actually accelerating it upward, which means that the tension force this direction is greater than the gravitational force. To be zen with our forces, we have one that's greater than the other. And we can say then that the F net in the upward direction says that tension is accelerating it upward and weight is trying to prevent that. Now, F nets are equations. Mass times acceleration, F net equation equals the tension force that we don't know. Don't put in 550. This is just telling us what its maximum is. We wanna know is the value that I get for this particular scenario going to be greater or less than 550? So now my problem is I can't solve this unless I know the acceleration. That's where this problem becomes so difficult because it's now involving motion variables. Here's the distance it moved. Here's the speed that it picked up. Started at rest. Getting a little sick feeling in your stomach right now? Yeah, I know. So these are the motion variables. So you go to your cheat sheet and you find the equation that says VF squared equals VI squared plus 2AB. And then we put in that 3 squared equals 0 squared plus 2 times A times 3 meters. And now we can solve for A. 3 squared is 9. Divide that by 6 would give me 1.5. Okay. Now that we have that acceleration, I'm going to go over here and put that into this. And now we'll see what happens. I'm nervous. Are you? I was supposed to be in blue. In case anybody takes screenshots, I like my slides to be nice and color coded. 50 times 1.5, 75? Yeah, 75. Add 500 to that, you get 575 newtons. Wah, 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 your rope breaks, okay? All right, chapter six, homeworks one and two. Thank you for your attention. That was a lot of notes. You guys are doing great. Keep it up.